I had to make sure that this went down far enough so it's far away enough from my eyes so that I can actually read it. Don't have my glasses with me. You know, today we're going to talk about uh, mishandling a decision. And that's just a really nice way for saying making a really, really bad decision. Uh, maybe in tonight's uh, word, as we look at this, this issue of living counterculture, maybe nobody here has encountered making a bad decision. And maybe I'm the only one who does that. But, but the reality is, is we have to learn not only how to avoid making bad decisions, but we have to learn what to do once we make a bad decision. And it's really, really important because in life we face many decisions. The reality is we make thousands and thousands and thousands of decisions, and sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not so good, but all Christians are called to glorify God with all of their decisions. We're all called to honor God, to obey God with the decisions we make. And that's not always easy when we live in a culture that continually contradicts what we're trying to live. A culture that is continually opposed to what we're trying to do and how we're trying to live. So we need to understand what we want to do and what we don't want to do when it all goes astray. In the aftermath of a bad decision. Tonight, I believe we're going to look at one of the worst, if not the all-time worst series of decisions recorded in scripture, uh, maybe outside of sending Jesus to the cross, but it's uh, infamous in its decision making and, and the story that goes with it. We're going to look at David and Bathsheba, and we're going to look at the entirety of that scenario, and we'll actually look at a second part um, next week. So David and Bathsheba making or mishandling a bad decision. So let's pray. And, uh, and we're going to look at what's in here and what we can learn from it. So, Lord, I just want to thank you so much for who you are, for your kingdom, for your glory, for the way, Lord, that you deserve honor and the way that you are so powerful, all-knowing, all-wonderful, Lord. And I pray that tonight we would encounter you in fullness, we would encounter your power, we'd encounter your presence, and that it would not just be a, a moment tonight of having an intellectual ascent about your word, but that we would actually be transformed by your word, that we would be changed by the core of what you're showing us through your word, and that we would strive to want to make better decisions in each and every one of our lives. We pray, Lord, that you would honor yourself, that you would glor glorify yourself in all we say and in all we do. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first thing we're going to look at tonight is leading from behind. This is a key element, I believe, in all decision-making, and it's interesting when we start looking at this we're looking at 2 Samuel chapter 11. And here's what it says. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Ramah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Now here is an interesting text. Sometimes we just read through the, skip, through the, the, the scriptures and we don't really look at what's happening here. But in the spring of the year, because the weather is changing, because it's finally becoming good weather, it was common in this day and in this time is that is when battles resumed. There was literally a time period during the winter when the battles would die down, when the fighting would die down, and then in the spring of the year, they would start to have battle again. And the Israelites had just attacked the Ammonites before the winter. They had gotten right up to Ramah, and they ran back within the city walls, and that's where it stopped. It was put on pause. And now they're going back to war. It's the spring of the year. And notice what it says, the time when kings go out to battle. The king's right place. And the place that David had commonly taken, historically, was to lead from the front. That was his responsibility. That was where he needed to be. That was where a king in this time era, that is where they belonged, was leading from the front. But David, just like so many leaders, just like leaders today, whether we're leading in athletics, whether we're leading in a job, whether we're, we're leading in the military, it's common for us to grow comfortable, to grow comfortable in our leadership. You get a handle on the situation or the organization or the company or the athletic team and everything's going well and you stop doing the things that got you where you are. And David is encountering that. 
Because in the spring of the year, at the time when he should have been going out to battle, he sent Joab, his commander, and the rest of the servants. And all Israel is heading out to war. And they had success. They were ravaging, it says, the enemy. But David remained at Jerusalem. I believe this about decision making in particular when it has to do with making a sinful decision or avoiding a sinful decision. I believe the number one factor that allows us as Christians to make right decisions is situation control. Situation control. I don't care how long you've walked with the Lord. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how old I am. I don't care what our history is, how wonderful our walk has been. If you continually place yourself, if I continually place myself in bad situations, we will make bad decisions. Situation control. That's what it's about. It's about controlling where you are, who you're with, and what you're doing. It's about not seeing how close to sin you can get and remain not in sin. It's about getting as far away from it as you possibly can. Doesn't mean that we don't go into tough situations in order to share the gospel. It doesn't mean that we go into tough situations because we're trying to build a relationship with somebody, but we don't go into foolish situations. We don't repeatedly place ourselves in a bad scenario because I believe that if you're in the right place, you will generally make right decisions. I also believe if you are in the wrong place, repeatedly, you will make wrong decisions. I will make wrong decisions. This concept that has taken Christianity these days, which should be so counter to the culture we live in, and has tried to make it as close to the culture as possible, is a lie. That was never God's objective. His directive to the church was never to be as much like the world as possible and then just sprinkle it with a little Jesus. That was never the plan. The plan is for us to shine the light of Christ because our lives are so diametrically opposed to the sinful world that is around us. And the only way for us to do that is to place ourselves in continual good situations. Can you think of an instant in your life when you were living right for the Lord and you exposed yourself to a bad situation, maybe even repeatedly? And how long did it take until you were making wrong decisions because you were placing yourself in wrong places? Anybody understand what I'm talking about? It happens. And here we have David, the king of the people of Israel, a warrior who led the Israelites into war over and over and over again. And for some reason, I don't want to over-speculate, maybe it was nothing more than just his level of comfort, he stayed back and is not leading in war. But then we know that one decision leads to more decisions. Look what happens next. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house. Now where should he have been? He should have been out in front of the troops. He should have been out in war. And instead, he is on the top of the roof of the king's palace. And anybody know about the way Israel and Jerusalem was built, where it was located? It was built on the highest hill. And he's looking down at the kingdom around him. So he's walking on the roof of the king's house. But he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. Now we have to understand something. We see things throughout our life that are absolutely outside of our ability to control them. The moment you see something, it is not a sinful moment when you can control the situation, when it was not of your own doing. There's no sin in what you see immediately. 
But to see, to linger, and then to lust in this situation moves you from okay to not okay. Moves you from the spirit to the flesh instantaneously. And then he saw, he lusted, and he took it a whole lot further. The scripture says to look upon a woman with lust in your heart is to commit adultery with her in your heart. That's where he's at. That's what's going on in this moment. David, the king of Israel, the mighty warrior, a man after God's own heart. And now, when he should be out leading the troops, he's gazing from the roof in comfort. And he notices a woman bathing, and his mind begins to wander. And David didn't just stop there. He sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the doctor of, I mean the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? This blows me away because if we just read the scriptures and we don't study history, we miss so much. Uriah the Hittite is one of his 30 mighty men. This is one of his ultimate warriors that he had gone into battle beside of. And even worse, guess who Eliam is? Not only Bathsheba's father, but another one of the 30 mighty men. These are guys that David was shoulder to shoulder with in battle, literally. So lineage and history is important. Context is so important when we study the scriptures. So David sent messengers and took her. She didn't have a choice. When the king says, you're coming here in this era, in this time frame, you're coming here. There was not an option. And she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Ten Commandments. Do not covet your neighbor's wife. Do not commit adultery. Because of a gaze that he took, because he wasn't where he was supposed to be, he has now broken two of the Ten Commandments. In a moment. And you see, that is how quick sin rushes into our lives if we don't guard our situation. By the time we say, uh-oh, it's too late. We have sinned. We have faltered. And I'm so thankful that we serve a God who is full of grace and mercy. But it doesn't mean just because he's a God who's full of mercy that there aren't consequences that we will face. Temporarily, sometimes forever. So David made some terrible choices. And it's key when it says there that she had just been purifying herself. Because that clearly means that she was not pregnant. There could be no mistake in what is coming next. See, it's things like that that we must study that we must pick up in the context of Scripture. Then she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. This really is an amazing encounter. It really is. David should have been out in front of the troops, and he was not. He was relaxing, looking from the roof of the king's palace when he should not have been there. He saw something that maybe he never should have seen, but he saw it, and he could have walked away. He could have turned away. He could have guarded his heart, and he chose not to. And then he made the decision further. He said, bring her here. And then he took it further. And now the result of this decision is that one of his 30 mighty men men's wife is now pregnant. 
covetousness, adultery, and as if that's not enough, it gets worse. High integrity. So David sent word to Joab, again, the leader of his army, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing. Think about this. Think about where this is going. Okay. He took his wife, had an adulterous moment with her, and all of a sudden he sends out to the battlefield and has him brought back in front of him. Do you see how crazy we can get when we start faltering down a sinful path? And here's something I learned a long time personally and in studying the scripture. Sin will always take you further than you thought it ever would. None of us start walking into sin saying, oh, wow, this is going to destroy the totality of my life. We walk into it usually saying, oh, this is going to be a great situation. And we're being pulled in our heart because we know the Holy Spirit within is convicting, but we still sometimes lunge in. But none of us think my world is going to fall apart because of this decision. And yet, it's a snowball effect. It just keeps picking up more and more debris as it rolls, and more and more problems come about. And how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Now understand what washing your feet means. It means go clean up, because you know when you washed your feet? Before you were going to bed. Everybody understand what's being said here. He is saying, go be with your wife. Because this is David's cover-up plan. I blew it. I made a terrible decision. Now I'm going to cover it up. Hey, Uriah, come back. Go take a break. Go be with your wife. Go down to your house. Wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house. And there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. Why? Because he was a man of high integrity. That's why. So David's first plan to scramble and fix his situation is an utter failure because he's dealing with a man who has high character. He has high character. So what does he do next? When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths or tents. And my lord Joab, the leader of the army, and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house and eat to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife as you live and as your son's soul lives? I will not do this thing because he had too much character. So now David's plan is a mess. And this is what happens. We make one sinful decision. It leads to another sinful decision. Before you know it, we're lying about those sinful decisions. Then we're building a cover-up plan to cover those decisions. And before you know it, it is all out of control. And again, I don't think I'm the only one in this room who's ever faced that. It's real. This is real stuff. It's easy for us to look at David and say, what a mess up you are. But we're one decision away. That's all we are. We're one decision away. And we need to understand that. So what happens next? Verse 12, then David said to Uriah, remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. He didn't go to his house. 
And David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank, so that he made him drunk. Plan two. Let's get the guy drunk. Surely he'll go to his house then. <coughs> and in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. David's scrambling. It's not working. The guy's got too much character. The guy's got too much uh, integrity in his life. He's not going to do it. How can he go and enjoy the comforts of his house when his buddies are out there in war? Can't do it. Not going to happen. So now what? Now what? In the morning, and to me this is the mo most amazing part of the whole story, blows me away what happens next. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. Are you kidding me? You may be saying, what are you talking about, Matt? Wait, you see what's in the letter. If you've not read this text before, are you kidding me? In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. Covetousness, adultery, and now murder. I've heard some who have written commentaries on this text say that this event led David to break all Ten Commandments. In my personal study, I've not been able to put all those pieces together, but I've heard some who have said that. But I can tell you what, there's three that are broken real clearly. But think about this. Uriah, who is one of his 30 mighty men, the 30 best warriors in all of Israel, who David fought with. He recruited and fought with them. Many battles. Just go read it. It's a great history. Now, all of a sudden, he steals his wife. She gets pregnant. He brings them in to cover it. The cover-up doesn't work. And now he's sending him out with a letter written to the commander that is literally the plan to have him killed. And he's carrying it himself. But he's a man of high integrity. So he's going to do what his commander, his king, tells him to do. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. Why? Because Joab also is a man who understood authority, and he's following his authority. We can debate that one and go back and forth. I believe that we follow authority until what we are being asked, what is being asked of us is sinful. And then at that point, we can not follow authority. You can study the scriptures and see where you're at on that. Authority is one of the forefront issues in all of scripture. I am very high on authority. But when I am asked to sin, I no longer have to be contained by the authority that I'm under, or be controlled by the authority that I'm under. He assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there'd be valiant men, and the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. That means they were killed. Uriah the Hittite also die, murder by someone else's hand. Then Joab sent and told David all the news about the fighting, and he instructed the messenger, when you have finished telling all the news about the fighting to the king, because remember, David and Joab are the only two who knew what was going on right now that we're aware of, that the story tells us. Then if the king's anger, anger rises, why will it, his anger rise? Because they got whooped. And they got whooped because they got too close to the city. And who's the commander that will be held responsible? Joab. So he says, and if the king's anger rises, and if he says to you, why did you go so near the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, the son of Jerubasheth? Did not a woman cast an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died at Thebes? Why did you go so near the wall? Then you shall say, here's the trump card. Then you shall say, 
your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Remember, boss, that's what you told me to do. That's what he's saying. That's why some other people died. It's a story with so much depth. It's such a rich, rich story. But it is a story of the failures of mankind. It is a story of the sinful nature of mankind. It is a story of the sinful nature that still dwells within you and me. It's a story of caution. And now Uriah the Hittite is dead also. It's interesting because if you follow all the history through and see who is who is who is who is who, Absalom, who would later become the enemy of his father David, who would later try to overthrow the kingdom, who would later take David's ten concubines and set up a, a tent on the top of the very same roof to defile his father in public. He was connected to Uriah and to the people in this story. It's really an amazing story. And if I'm remembering right, Joab leaves David to go follow Absalom. You could check that to make sure I'm correct on that, but I, I believe I am. Maybe this is why. Maybe Joab, in hindsight, is looking back and saying, this leader just had me kill one of our great warriors. Maybe that was why he fled. I know that's speculative. But those are the kind of things scripture should cause us to examine and look at. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent him to tell. The messenger said to David, the men gained an advantage over us and came out against us in the field but we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. Then the archers shot at your servants from the wall. Some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab. Just wanted to make sure that everything was okay. Do not let this matter displease you. For the sword devours now one and now another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it and encourage him. In other words, tell Joab it's okay. Because David knows why it happened. He orchestrated the events that caused the loss of life of not only Uriah, but of others of the nation of Israel. And that is a picture of the death of sin when we place ourselves into bad situations and we make bad decisions. It can become all-consuming in the lives of even those who follow a holy and awesome God. In our lives, it can become this consuming. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, isn't it incredible that her name is not mentioned one time up to this point? It is always referred to, she is always referred to rather as the wife of Uriah. Because the story is built around deceit and around adultery. And I believe that God wanted it to be clear that it's not Bathsheba that's the focal point. It's that she was a wife of another. She was the wife of this Hittite. She was the wife of Uriah. She lamented over her husband. And when the mourning was over, which is most likely at this time period, a seven-day period, and notice that there's no mention at all of David's lament over those who had lost their life, over Uriah or any of the others. David sent and brought her to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David has, had done displeased the Lord. An amazing story. There's more to the story. And we'll actually look at it next week when we meet. We're going to meet the 7th and the 21st this week. So we're back to back two weeks. 
there's so much more to the story. And I'm thankful that's what, what is more to the story is that we serve a redemptive God. A God who even when we blow it to this capacity, he is a gracious God who is, has an everlasting love, who is merciful and often does not give us what we deserve. But the problem is when we make the decision to enter into rebellion or sin against the holy God, we lose control over what those consequences will or will not be. We take that out of our hands the moment we make decisions that stand against him. And so we find a story tonight, historically true, about mishandling a decision. And we see the way that decisions snowball into more and more bad decisions. The great thing is, is that when we make right decisions, that also snowballs. And our faith grows when we continually make right decisions and we are strengthened and we are encouraged when we see the results of that. Maybe there's some of us here who are in the midst of making great decisions and maybe there's some here who are making some not so great decisions. The reality is, is that to be a follower of Christ means that we are going to choose as a pattern of life to walk in obedience. We know we don't do it perfectly, but the general practice of our life should be one of obedience. And so I want to encourage you with this very difficult story that God is good. He is on the throne. If you are struggling with bad decisions, as far as I can tell, you have breath right now, which means you're still alive and you have an opportunity to make a change. The king isn't sending you out to the front and withdrawing troops so that you're dead. You still have opportunity. So make a change. Because the change we're going to see is going to be twofold. We're going to see a loving friend confront a king, and then we're going to see repentance and what it looks like. So no matter what your scenario is or what your situation is, there is hope. Because we serve a God of great hope. So let's pray. Father God, we do thank you so much for who you are, how glorious you are. We thank you for your word. And we're thankful, Lord, that you didn't omit from your scripture when your people made bad decisions so that we might learn from these situations, from these scenarios that they faced, so that we might see the reality of what happens when we choose to make bad decisions and so that we might see your power and your redemption in the aftermath of bad decisions. Lord, we just want to honor you with our lives. As a local church body, we want to glorify you. We want to make an impact for you into the darkness that surrounds us. We pray, dear Lord, that you would empower us with a testimony that shines brightly into the darkness, with a power that can come only from you, and with a love that for you is so evident to all those who look on. Lord, we praise you, and we honor you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.